the character in Toy Story, Woody, who was a has-been TV figure who was living with some identity ignorance. We are people who are children of God, and we can truly be amazed at the titles and the names and the symbols that God uses to reference us. We have looked at a number of those, studied some of them in greater detail than others, but just what we begin to see and unfold as we look to Scripture and all of these different ways that God references his obedient children is truly amazing. I want to remind you as we start today that not only does Scripture give names for those who obey God, there's also names given for those who don't. And some of those include unbeliever, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, John chapter 9, Jesus says the unbelieving are blind. Ephesians chapter 5 talks about it being a time of darkness. Ephesians chapter 2 says it's a time of death. And Titus 3.3 3 gets three of them, foolish, disobedient, and deceived. So there are titles for those who are disobedient as well. And here is another, Romans chapter 1. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. Those who reject God's invitation of reconciliation are said by Paul to suppress the truth. In other words, they're not, they're not subject to the truth. They're not listening to the truth. They're going to put it down however they can. They suppress the tu truth but they do so by their own unrighteousness. We looked at this morning how the fall of humanity introduces us to how humans seek to become their own God, and in so doing, they practice unrighteousness, which just leads then to the wrath of God, is what Paul says in Romans chapter 1. Following self-established truth is at the root of human unrighteousness. It was true in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve followed the lust to the knowledge of good and evil. They desired that knowledge. They wanted to be as God. And so they decided to disobey God and became unrighteous. Human attempts to establish their own righteousness fail before they even begin. I love the way Charles Spurgeon put that. The greatest enemy to human souls is the self-righteous spirit, which makes them look to themselves for salvation. And that's what unrighteousness is. It's trusting in myself for my salvation. Isaiah says that none of us are righteous. He makes it very plain that all of our righteous acts, if you take the best days that you have, the most righteous periods of time that you have, and put it all together, together he says it's like a filthy garment, a filthy garment, a polluted garment, actually, literally, the Hebrew phrase there is talking about a minstrel rag. So our best righteousness is filthy. But that's all we can muster on our own. Romans chapter 3, Paul will say there is no one righteous. No, not one. And he will quote numbers of other Old Testament passages. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. Together they have become useless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Viper's venom is on their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their path. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Again, a description of unrighteousness. So today, the word that I would like for us to look at and to discuss is the word righteous. Us becoming and being righteous. There we go. Here's what's so amazing about this name. I cannot be righteous, but God names me that. <laughs> I cannot be righteous, but God names me righteous. The Greek word is dikos, and it means just. Vines gives a single, simple definition for it. Thayer in his Greek lexicon will actually show how there are different applications of the word, one of them being observing divine laws, another one upright, keeping commands of God, and a third innocent, faultless, or guiltless. So 
righteousness, being just, being without guilt, being faultless, being upright, keeping commands of God, observing divine laws. As I was studying this, the concept of righteousness, I came across a definition by John Stackhouse, and I thought this really will lay itself out well for what I want us to look at. Here's how he defines it. Righteousness is God's concern to make things right. It involves judging and analyzing what is wrong, what's deficient, what's less than perfect, and then actively making it right. Looking out to see what's wrong, to see what there is that is deficient, that's less than perfect, and then engaging in some activity that will make it right. I want to look at two aspects of that righteousness today. And the first is this, how God is going to look out and analyze and judge what he's going to look at, how he can make humanity right. How is he going to accomplish that? So God's activity to make one righteous. First of all, he's going to end the old. He is going to offer a new. And then he's going to give a gift that will become human righteousness, human rightness. The ending of our old life is, the, is accomplished by removing sin's condemning power over us forever. Every faithful believer, according to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, who is faithful until death is going to receive a crown of life. When we die to the old self, we die to it forever. That does not mean we cannot serve him again. But there's a death takes place. We are not just a little forgiven. We are not slightly absolved. We are not somewhat pardoned. We are eternally exonerated. I want you to get a hold of that. What God did to make us righteous is not just fix up our old person. He gave us something entirely new, but before he could do that, he had to take the old completely away. There is no more condemnation to those that are in Christ. Why not? Because that old has been taken away. It's no longer condemning me. I am eternally exonerated. I love Paul's discussion in Romans chapter 7 where he's sharing his own spiritual trauma, wrestling with the fact that there's part of him that wants to do what is right, but there's part of him that is desiring to do wrong. And he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh to the law of sin. We looked at this morning the beginning of that sinful desire in our flesh. Paul says, I never, it's still there, but guess what? It's dead. It's gone. He says, therefore... No condemnation now exists to those who are in Christ because the Spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Been rescued from that. Our old creature is a sin factory. We don't need to ever forget that. Our old self, our flesh, desires sin. It wants us to be sinful. Jesus will make the remark that out of people's hearts come evil desires and sexual immoralities and thefts and murder, adultery, greed, evil actions, deceit, lewdness, stinginess, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All of these evil things come from within and defile a person. Those are parts of our flesh. Jesus makes us know the flesh is a sin factory. But God's way to actively right our wrong is not to change our old man. It begins with his desire to put the old one to death, to crucify him. Every one of us who desires to be righteous with God has to die to self. We still live on in the flesh, but we die to that old man. Romans puts it this way, Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into what? into death. Whose? 
Oh, we're buried with him into his death. But who all is dying? Look, in order just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in a new way of life. For if we are joined with him in the likeness of his death, if we are joined with him in the likeness of his death, if we die like Jesus died, then we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him. What happened to Jesus in crucifixion? He died. What happens to our old self when we are doing these events with Jesus? Our old self dies. So that sin's dominion over the body may be abolished, so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. Not sinless, but we're not enslaved to it any longer. We are freed from the old self of sin. Death and burial are words of finality. The, word in, the words indicate an end. The sinful old life lives on until it is put to death and buried with Christ. And then we need to ask questions, how, do, how does that happen? When does that happen? We go back to Romans, the same opening. We begin a little earlier and then we go afterwards. Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death, we died with him. Therefore, we're buried with him by baptism into death. Then verse 9, we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, no longer dies. Jesus is done dying. He died in the flesh. Guess what happens when you and I die to our old self? We're done dying. It's done. It's out of the way. And so, no longer death rules over him. Guess what? No longer the old self rules over us. That deserves our old self is gone when we take on the righteousness that God offers us. So you too, he says, consider yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Our old life ended when we put it to death and buried it in the grave of baptism. An action emulating the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. An act which physically replicates the gospel message. You know, Paul will let us know in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that the gospel that he presented to them, which they accepted and which they received and which they obeyed, in which they now stand, and he says it is what now saves you. He says that gospel was the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. I proclaim to you that Jesus died for your sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and on the, he raised up on the third day. That's the gospel message, isn't it? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's how the good news comes to be. We, cannot, we can escape death because Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected. Paul says that gospel message, that good news that he proclaimed was received, that it brought on salvation, that it was the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He also says that it is that gospel that can either be obeyed, Romans chapter 10 and verse 16, or it can be disobeyed. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8, it says when Jesus comes with his angels in flaming fire to deal out retribution on those who have, do not love God and have not obeyed the gospel. The gospel can be obeyed. That leads me to this question. The factual message of the gospel is the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. How do you obey or disobey a fact? How do you disobey or obey a fact? The gospel message is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. How is it you and I obey that? By engaging in that same action. We have seen that obeying the gospel is the action of putting to death our old self, burying our old self, and being resurrected a new self. That's how we obey the gospel, is we go through the actions of that fact. God can justly rename his children righteous because of the activity he engaged in through the sacrifice of Jesus. Paul expresses that process this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. Now everything is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and 
he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, certain that God is appealing through us to plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You took off your former way of life, the old man that is corrupted by deceitful desires. You are being renewed in the spirit of your minds. You put on the new man, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. Therefore, this faith came. We were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. The Old Testament law was, if you will, it was the school bus driver that got us to where we needed to learn about Jesus. And now Paul says that faith has come. We're no longer under the supervision of the law. We're in the schoolhouse now. We don't need the bus driver anymore. You are all, he says, sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And for all of you who were baptized into Christ, you clothed yourself with Christ. When one is clothed in Christ, guess what happens? When God sees us, he sees the righteousness of the clothing of Jesus. Appreciate Jim's reading of the return of the, what we typically call the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. The description of how the father welcomes him back is just always amazing. Looking down the road, waiting for the son, runs to him, embraces him, kisses him. He grants his forgiveness and acceptance. But there's something revealed about God through the parable in the character of the father. And that is that he recognizes in what his returning son says that the old man's still there. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me a slave. Just make me a servant. Do you know what God hears when you and I are stuck on our old self, he hears the same message that that son was giving to the father. I'm not worthy. But do you remember what the, what the father does in this parable? But the father told his slaves, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. The righteousness of the returning son didn't just deserve a new robe. It was the best robe. I wonder, whose was it? Is it his? Is the best robe in this house the father's? I don't think it's a stretch. And he says, I want you to bring out the best robe and put it on this returning prodigal. This one now who wants to be right with me. The best robe. The father clothed the son in that which proved his acceptability. If you are in Christ, God has redressed you. And when he looks at you, he sees the best robe. And that's why we are challenged to not spot the robe that we've been given, because it's the best. But everything that was gained to me, Paul will say, I have counted but lost because of Christ. More than that, I'm considered everything to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them filth so that I may gain Christ and be found where? In him. I want to be found in him, not having what? A righteousness of my own. Why not, Paul? Because your own righteousness on the best day is nothing but a filthy rag. Because there is no one righteous. No, not one. I want my righteousness not to be mine, but to be Jesus. The one that is through faith in Christ. The righteousness from whom? From God. That's what we've been offered. Romans chapter 5, since by the one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, Adam. How much more will those who receive 
the overflow of grace. It's a great word, the over and above, more than what grace should give, just overflowing grace. The gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Christ Jesus. So then as, the, as through one trespass there is condemnation for everyone, so also through one righteous act there is life-giving justification for everyone. For just as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so also through the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Righteous. You know, there's five much mores in Romans chapter 5. This is a freebie. We're much more justified by blood. We are much more reconciled. The gift of God is much more. Grace is much more. Abounding, abounding grace is much more. What that phrase means <clears throat> is what we lost in Adam's sin is more than made up in the righteousness of Jesus. He just doesn't bring us back here. He brings us up here. More than. Much more than. Okay, the second thing, second aspect of righteousness. The first aspect is this. God has evaluated, he has judged the shortcomings that exist in humanity. He has figured out how to actively enable us to have the opportunity to be made righteous. But now I judge and analyze what is wrong, deficient, and less than perfect in me and actively work to make it better to make me righteous. God has proclaimed me righteous by being in his son. But I do something to make myself more righteous because I am aware of who I am. Although God views us as being saved in the righteousness of Jesus, those in Christ do not live without, with perfect righteousness. Scripture puts it very simply. He says, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, that we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, he says we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins. So, Scripture makes it very plain. Even when I take on the righteousness of Jesus, Dan still sins. Dan still commits sin. Here is the glory of being in Christ's righteousness. We've been made righteous in Christ. And so we have full and abiding peace with God. My old man is gone. Done. I am a new creature. I am at peace with God. Because of the righteousness I've accepted in Jesus Christ. And in that peace, I want to become more righteous because that confirms that I'm a child of God. I don't desire it for self-righteousness. I'm at peace with God and I desire to be more righteous because it brings greater glory to Him. I found this. A bar of iron costs five bucks. You make it into horseshoes, it's worth 12. You make it into needles, medical needles, it's worth 3,500 bucks. If you turn it into springs for Swiss watches, it's worth $300,000. You know what that says? That says when God makes me the most valuable thing on the face of the earth, I need to be making myself the most valuable thing on the face of the earth. I need to be confirming what he is doing in me. I need to do that, not for me, but to glorify him. And if I don't, I'm not only the one who suffers, I fail as one made righteous in Jesus to glorify the one who's made me righteous. And let him down. Peter says, if these qualities are yours, after going through, add to your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, after going through that list, he says, if these qualities are yours in an ever-increasing manner, they don't render you useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord. He says, the person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted. And what has he forgotten? He's forgotten who's made him righteous. Therefore, brothers, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. 
but also because our growth in personal righteousness glorifies the one who makes us righteous. Do you not know that your body is the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you? You're not your own. You've been bought with the price. Therefore, glorify God. We have been given the responsibility to develop ourselves more rightly, to look and find out what's still amiss in us, and to glorify God. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not from works that anyone should boast. We are his creation created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Righteous works. We're glorifying him. We're glorifying the one who's created us when we engage in deeds that help us develop more righteousness. Considering our title of righteous, when we're in Christ, we become perfectly righteous in the eyes of God. When we are in Christ, we continually identify areas of our life that can be made more righteous and better glorify the one who is making us righteous. We stretch for greater righteousness. And that's what Paul says in Philippians. After he has talked about the fact that he counts all of this but loss, he wants to gain righteousness that's found in Jesus Christ. Then he says, it's not that I've already achieved this or that I've already been made perfect. But he says, this one thing I do, I forget what lies behind because the old man is gone. And I stretch, reach forward to what lies ahead. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. That's where the righteousness lies. It looks like Paul knows the two points that we've been ending many of our lessons with. Number one is this. I'm not what I need to be, but I'm also not what I once was. I'm not what I once was. I, the old man has been taken away by the fact that God calls me righteous in Christ. But he also understands that it is the work and the power and the ability of God that aids me in becoming more of what he's named me. God is at work in us.